Hello, everybody. Welcome to the first uh, webinar series, Inside Out by Dovetail, uh, where we cover uh, design, research, product development, and uh, the big ideas and the craft behind those, those three big areas. Uh, today, I've got some really special guests, uh, Jonathan Wadowski from Maze, CEO and founder of Maze, and Benjamin Humphrey, CEO and co-founder of Dovetail. Uh, welcome, gentlemen. How are you going? Good. 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 Uh, uh, burning hot in New York right now, but uh, we're trying to, to pass by. Yep. And we've got Benjamin <laughs> uh, dialing in from San Francisco. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. I'm in, I'm in our San Francisco office um, and uh, typical San Francisco summer behind me. So a bit overcast and about 17, 18 degrees Celsius. Don't know what that is in Fahrenheit. But... Well, I'm uh, dialing in from sunny Australia. It is winter over here and it is morning. Um, uh, shout out to any fellow Antipodians who are out there waking up early to uh, catch this webinar. Um, and good afternoon and good evening to everybody else. Uh, this, this is uh, truly, truly a global, global it's showing. Isn't it? it is literally <laughs> good, like covering the entire globe right now. It's incredible. It is. Yeah, it's um, so um, folks, let's just get started and jump straight in. Uh, we're here to talk about how research is getting disrupted. Uh, so obviously it's been a big year this year, particularly and the last for research. And uh, we want to talk about three major sort of issues and uh, trends. So technology and the disruptive technological advances that have occurred over the past year, uh, the economy um, and sort of changing and shifting business priorities that have come with that. So to get started, um, it would be remiss not to mention the Elephant in the room, artificial intelligence, AI. Uh, so from two product founders, I want to get your opinion. What's the uh, what's your opinion on the current hype around AI? Is it a, a silver bullet for all our ills? Uh, you know, dystopian nightmare waiting to happen, neither, both, something else. Joe, let's start with you. Yeah. <clears throat> So first of all, I think I think it's exciting. Uh, I think it, in the midst of the doom and gloom of the, the current market, uh, it, it kind of ignites and infuses a renewed sense of uh, tech-led passion for the people. Like we're seeing so much excitement, so much things that are being built. So as, as a founder, I have to find this exciting, right? Because I think we've been we've been yeah cursed with the the current market, and this is kind of a, a beacon of line in in all of this. Um, and then I think like uh, such a, a disruptive technology and disruptive as in like fast dramatic adaption across industries, it forces us to strategically think about the tactical impact, like how it's going to replace tools and processes, but more importantly, how it affects the, the overall organization design and power dynamics. And so while I don't think it's a silver bullet or it's going to replace everything overnight, which are the big fears from this, I think it's going to introduce very interesting changes to different roles and, and organizational structure. So that's what I'm excited about. Excellent, Benjamin. What about you, Ben? Yeah, I, I think um, I agree with, with Jonathan. Like, it's it's very exciting. Um, I think it is a bit overhyped at the moment. Like, I think the term is 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 sort of like misunderstood. You know, when we talk about AI, I think the most recent advance, obviously, is like large language models, which is very interesting, and in, and in the generative AI stuff, and like obviously like Mid Journey and and Stable Diffusion. I think that's really cool and and incredible for creative pursuits. And I think we're all just trying to figure out in in research like which parts of the research journey it actually um, replaces. Like. I was talking to someone this morning and somebody on our team told told me about how um, when instant cake mix came out, uh, people still wanted to feel, they did a lot of research around instant cake mix and they wanted to feel like they still were baking. And that's the reason why they don't use powdered eggs and that you have to add your own eggs to the instant cake mix because that mm -hmm. was apparently the thing that people felt like they wanted to retain this feeling that they're still baking, uh, which I thought was a really interesting anecdote and, and very similar to AI. So yeah. When we talk to our customers, I'm trying to figure out what exactly is it that you want to want to hold on to uh, with research and your workflow right now, and what are the things you want to get rid of? Like, what is the egg? Uh, exactly. That, that, well, yeah, and your patience, Benjamin. What uh, what do you think might be the egg in the uh, research process so far? Well, I mean, other than participant recruitment, which is always number one pain point for researchers whenever we talk to them, the second biggest thing is the manual analysis and synthesis. And I'm, I'm sort of trying to figure out, like, honestly, I think that, you know, we've made some progress in, in automating some of that with like um, vector based clustering and, and a feature that we launched recently where you can um, do thematic analysis as well as obviously summarization. But, 
you still have to kind of read the content, I think, to really understand it and to be able to confidently put together research reports and insights and also be like the sort of expert that your team can can rely on to answer questions. So I don't think it can fully replace that part of the workflow, but it seems like most of the excitement today is about how it can speed up the analysis and synthesis process. Excellent. Um, just quickly, anyone, <clears throat> welcome to everybody in the audience today as well. Um, if you want to chime in and let us know what's the egg, um, what, what part of the research process would you would you actually like to continue hanging on to and which part of the research research process do you really, really want out of there? Um, let us know. Yeah. Jonathan? Yeah. Exactly. I think I think the egg for me is like what needs to be researched first of all, right? Like what are the things that we actually need to do to 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 research as an organization, and then ultimately, once we have the synthesis of all of this, what is the strategic direction that we need to take? I think those two things are the egg of the process. Like I, I don't think people care deeply about the data collection piece. They don't care deeply about the tagging process. Like all of these things, ultimately, will need to be at at worst assisted, at best replaced, right? I think that the the strategic role that research has to play is what do we need to research? Where do we need to build conviction? And then ultimately, what do we do now to build conviction? Where are we headed with that? And I don't think, well, AI is great with the known knowns, running processes that we know how to run. They are not great with the unknowns, right? And so those two unknowns, what we need to drive and where are we going are the two things that, that for me, are the egg of the, the research process. Totally. Like, it seems like um, because the large language models are sort of trained on the internet, they are by definition kind of the average. And so if there's a lot of specialties and niches and niche use cases where I feel like it's just not gonna do a good job with like industry jargon and all the context and all the, all the biases that you have to bring to the process, right? Um, you know, I was talking to a customer this week, they're like a trucking logistics company. They do a lot of research uh, with stakeholders in Colombia. And so they're it's kind of struggling with the transcription accuracy in non-English languages and then you know, the, the idea that AI can just sort of analyze all of this very um, specific truck truck logistics related, uh, you know, Colombian kind of specificity um, is, is a little far-fetched, I think. So I, I think yeah. there are some things where it's really good at, like it seems to be very good at summarization. And obviously that helps us a lot because it can take a large amount of data and, and simplify it down. But you're still going to have to understand the, the 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 data that you're working with, I believe, and and be able to to be able to confidently write reports and things and, and put your name to that. Yeah, yeah. I also to to jump on that for one quick second. I also believe the human that we're trying to solve for are things that are not going to be replaced and that are going to to remain the egg of of the process. Right, talking to the actual human, and I think there's been a lot of conversation about synthetic users and all of the things that attach to that. My, my, my key belief is there's not such a thing as a monolithic user and a monolithic human in the history of humanity. And so all of this will remain the key value that research brings to the table is also bringing the empathy of the actual human we are trying to solve for as an organization. So that I don't think will be replaced. Right. No, totally. And, and I think a lot of research is about specifically finding the outliers and the edge cases and not just the, the, the average, right. And, but, and by definition, like a large language model is kind of like the average, cause it's the sum of all of the internet simplified and summarized, exactly. uh, down to, you know, the, the mean. <laughs> so like with that in mind, how are both of you sort of thinking about uh, your approach to building AI features into dovetail and into maze? Cause you said like a lot of like really important points about like where the humans fit into the process, uh, where like human thought is valuable, perhaps where AI is like the expectations are up here, but perhaps the realities are here. Um, like what, but how is this, how does this sort of pan out when it comes to product strategy, uh, Benjamin? Yeah. So we've got, uh, two AI features in beta that we're sort of doing a proper launch for this month. And, you know, one of them is uh, summarization which is exactly what you think it is. Pretty straightforward, uh, summarizes transcripts, summarizes documents, insights, and so on. Works fairly well. And then the second one, which is kind of interesting, which is actually not really using a large language model as much as a more traditional machine learning uh, sentence embedding and, and clustering algorithm, takes um, basically takes the highlights you've created and automatically groups them into themes on the canvas. And this is, this is probably the more interesting thing for researchers where you're actually having the AI do the thematic analysis. But one of the really interesting things we've been struggling with is if you, if you go deep into this, it's, it's actually impossible to 
know what the objective like truth is yeah. for a clustered set of data. And so, you know, I, I might label something, you know, billing, whereas Jonathan might label it, you know, economy or purchasing. Yeah. And it's not clear who's right, you know, and this yeah. is actually like a massive problem in the industry. And we're, as we've been going deep on it, there's like all these PhD papers and stuff about like, what is what is the ground truth? Like, what is real? What is objectively truthful? And uh, it's actually not, it's impossible to answer because naturally when you do an affinity mapping or a grouping exercise, you're bringing your context and your biases to that exercise. Yeah. And if you do it and someone else does it, you get totally different results usually. So we're finding that even though the AI is grouping things from its point of view, our customers or our users are sometimes unhappy with the results. And, and mostly it's because it's not what they're expecting because it doesn't line up with their own context or their own biases. So that's where the hype, I think, and reality start to kind of merge together and, and, and you start to get the rubber meeting the road a wee bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. again, like just like the, never thought you would be getting into the nature of truth and uh, such a philosophical <laughs> depth. Well, no, it, it, does, <laughs> it, does, it does get um, philosophical because if you think about, you know, if, if, if you're given like a, a series of items to sort, into different buckets and you and you do that uh a series of different people does they do they do it all differently absolutely right? joe yeah and, and you see that really so to, to to jump on what you said i think you see this relationship already between the research team and the rest of the product team where there's a relationship of trust that needs to be built about how do you take the data show me the data behind all of this and what it does is, is create another layer of trust that needs to be built between the ai agent and model and the researcher <laughs> and so all of a sudden you have the researcher asking the ai about show me the data show me what, what how you come to the conclusion that you're coming to and then this uh created a new layer of relationship you know, of trust with everyone else and so at maze we um one of the big challenges uh, that we have uh, with supporting people who do research is to provide them with the knowledge and the guardrails to operate with limited know-how on, on research. And so for us, this has meant productizing a lot of the knowledge. So with question banks and with templates and articles and guides, and then a lot of the insight surfacing is similar with automated reports and stuff. And so we see AI as kind of a, a catalyst to what we've been trying to achieve by allowing us to put micro experts, so in this case, trained models, at every stage of the, the research process, from how do you ask the right and biased question? How do you uh, then turn those insights into something that, that's going to be coherent? And so on top of this, so on top of the tactical stuff about ensuring that uh, there, there's know-how throughout the process, we're exploring how generative AI can blur the line between moderated and unmoderated research and bring the best of both worlds, where we can bring the scale of unmoderated and the way of the moderated inside one coherent experience. And so we haven't announced anything yet, but we'll do some uh, exciting announcement about this soon. So if you're interested in joining the beta, I'll, I'll drop my LinkedIn in the in the chat. And so feel free to add me and, and we'll, we'll set you up there. Yeah, I think one of the, like obviously dovetail being analysis and synthesis tool, um, we're pretty interested in the space. And I think one of the most interesting use cases for like AI analysis or thematic classification is voice of customer where we have a lot of our customers. And I think everybody has this challenge where they've actually got a lot of information already, like product feedback, MPSC sat responses, support tickets, yeah. existing interviews and data, existing reports. And so we're looking at how we can actually build a, like a data processing pipeline that allows you to uh, yeah. put that data in and then get essentially a stack rank list of, of uh, insights out of the back of it or themes out of the back of it. And it's, it works quite well for that kind of data. Like if you give, if you sort of have a, a large set of similar items, you know, you're kind of comparing apples to apples. Yeah. The, the issue with like interviews and usability testing and transcripts is that, you know, it's not, you, you can talk about so many different things, so many different topics, and you don't have as, as many of them. It's not like for like, you know, maybe you have five usability test recordings. Uh, so it's, it's a little harder. It's a lot more nuanced, whereas the higher volume like for like, um, like support tickets, I think is a really great use case for AI tagging. Um, yeah. So yeah. Excellent. Uh, we're going to jump onto yeah. the economy right now, which is a, another huge issue. Uh, so we're going from philosophy and the AI stuff, uh, to the easy stuff, which is talking about, um, the economy, obviously it's been, uh, top of mind for pretty much everybody. Uh, most of all business leaders like yourselves, people who are running companies, uh, and organizations. Now there's no detailed data really about like who's been impacted most by layoffs this year, but 
uh, just from sort of qualitative assessment and from the research community, we're hearing that uh, they may have been disproportionately affected. Do you think uh, that is true? And if so, why? Jonathan. So I think support functions in general have been more impacted that, than direct revenue generating function. And I think that's, that's the way that research plays inside the org. I, I also believe that, unfortunately, a lot of the, the research layoff are a direct function of the maturity of research in organization, right? That's something that we've seen in the past 10 years and how bought in they really were on the value of research. And we have we have this ongoing joke at, at Maze where we say we're selling the religion and the, the religion and the Bible, right? Where we basically say when we when we uh, talk to a customer, really what we do is we do a lot of education on the value of research before we can even talk about how Maze helps you get this value, right? And so um, I think the goal now for us is to equip uh, companies with the know-how on how to sell the ROI of research and how to connect, better connect really um, research data with business outcome. And I think that that's how we bypass the, the, the current uh, rounds of layoff that we're seeing. Benjamin? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm not sure necessarily if, if research has been sort of disproportionately affected. Um, I mean, sales has been pretty pretty heavily affected as well. I would say, however, the, the points made in some of those articles that were written, like the Medium one uh, that came out a few weeks back, I, I do resonate with that. I think I think there's been um, it's interesting comparing I think research and sort of researchers to design and designers over the last ten or fifteen years and how. I feel like designers have done such a good job of positioning the craft as such a mission critical, uh, you know, discipline that that drives business value. And I also think it helps a lot that design is 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 just visual and and you know, traditionally like v things that are visual, like humans just love visual stuff. You know, v consuming video over text. And I think with design, it's like you can create these these sort of beautiful mock-ups and prototypes and things and everything, and it's it's so much more engaging with stakeholders. And I think that's where, I think that's where research as a craft has somewhat fallen over a little bit. Is that um, I don't think researchers have made their work visual enough and engaging enough, and we're still hanging on to like sort of long-form written research reports, uh, you know, the, yeah. the sort of traditional way of doing it. Maybe as a holdover from academic research. And I think that that's one thing. And I think the other issue is maybe the, the pragmatism, um, you know, like research projects just take a long time. And I think like, I don't feel like researchers always get that balance of like, of speed and rigor uh, correct in a, in a commercial setting, especially again, people who have come from academia, academia, um, they, they, you know, they're over optimizing potentially for rigor. And in that, in that uh, world, they're actually losing the opportunity to give uh, product teams in like commercial settings more directional insights earlier on. Yeah, interesting to mention that. So Benjamin, you mentioned the UX, uh, the article, uh, the UX research reckoning is here by Jared Anton on, on Medium. Yeah. So that was, I'm sure a lot of folks in the uh, audience today have read the article, but just to give a quick overview, uh, Judd, who's a researcher himself, um, sort of mentioned that, yes, of course, economic conditions are like at play here, but perhaps at the, it's there's like a larger crisis that has been ongoing within the discipline. Uh, for the last decade or so. And it, it kind of touches on a few things that you've just mentioned there, Benjamin. But I think one of the main particular points that the author makes is that uh, there are three major kind of types of research. That's just sort of macro research, which is strategic and helps businesses make decisions. There's your mid-level research, which is like your sort of product research. That's what you might consider with like your user interviews. Um, and then there's micro research, which is, you know, QA style, usability tests, eye tracking, things like that. Um, the author concludes that there's been far too much time spent on the mid-level. What is the opinion of you folks, Joe? Yeah, <clears throat> um, I agree that we need to do a better job at the, at the macro level, right? It all connects back to the connecting research data with business outcome. Um, a few weeks back, I was at the UXR conference by, by learners in Toronto with, with a lot of great research practitioners. And there we discussed the, the role of research and how the lack of C-level representation limited our capacity to expose the value of research at the strategic level. Um, and that forced us into the micro and the mid range, which is ultimately where researchers sit, right? Like in the organization. And so we've now seen examples of chief insight officer in different organizations that were overseeing research and data and analytics and using those three functions strategically across the org. And I believe that we'll need to see much more of that in the future for uh, the, the value to be uh, perceived and for us to sit at the macro level. 
And then again, it comes back to the, the conversation about the ROI, right? Because ultimately, what does it mean to connect research data to business outcome? It, it means that we can measure the impact of research. And one of the key uh, problems of research, in my opinion, is that companies can only see the actual ROI of research when we fail, right? You can only see the ROI of research when you release the wrong product to the market, when you, really, when you go with the wrong strategy direction and you see your business unit fail. And so ultimately, we need to all, all of us do a better job at connecting this research data to business outcome. And I think it's our role as, as player in the space to help both educate and then productize that, those uh, connections. Yeah, I, I think it's a good point in the article, you know, at, at the low level, at the micro level, I think it's quite straightforward to connect the research insights to like business impact, you know, connecting usability issues and findings to, to JIRA issues and bugs and stuff and, and actually delivering changes in the product. And it's quite tangible, but you're not really getting visibility from the leadership team and the executive team, I think. So one of the funny things I think about researchers is, um, again, maybe comparing to designers, I think researchers are potentially a little too humble at times and don't advocate for themselves in their role as much as I feel like they should. Um, you know, I think the work that researchers do in a lot of industries, I mean, we have, we have a hugely diverse customer base and I talk to our customers all the time and I'm just fascinated by the kind of stuff that they're doing, but I don't see it enough, you know, and I don't feel like we, we, I don't feel like they're probably sharing it enough internally. Um, but then the macro stuff is really, really important for like executives and leadership teams. You know, you really want research, I think, as, as a CEO, you, you want the research to tell you a lot of things you don't know mm -hmm. or, you know, you actually don't know. And that's where you start getting into almost market research and like trying to validate assumptions and hypotheses that you have as like a leader or, or a, an executive to, 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 to drive prioritization decisions. Um, one of the things we're doing right now, just to sort of as a, as a meta point, um, we're actually doing a kind of combination of user research uh, you know, assumption validation, concept testing, and a bit of market research and competitor analysis. We're kind of doing a whole bunch of different stuff uh, as part of our building a our AI feature set because one of the assumptions we have is that, uh, you know, re we, we don't know what researchers actually want to give up in that workflow. And, and there's always issues around trust in AI mm -hmm. analysis, uh, as well as I think the expectations for what the AI can actually do. And so we're trying to do a whole heap of sort of exploratory uh, research, which really blurs the boundaries between many different types of methods. Um, and I think that's, I'm personally finding that very helpful. Uh, our team's working on that right now. And that's an example of like more of a macro thing. I think when you get stuck in the mid range, it's not really clear who you're helping, you know, you're not helping yeah. the executives and you're not helping the individual engineers. And, and to your point, to add, to add to your point on design, I think design was, was not always like that. So I come from a traditional design <laughs> background and research background and even five years ago, design was very different to what we're seeing today. And what happened was two things, right? On one end, there was heavy investment from the major players in educating the market. You've seen the McKinsey business value of design and you'd see Envision working on the design frontier at the time where Figma was not a thing yet. And then mm -hmm. what happened afterward was actually some form of democratization. And what I mean by that is that no CEO were in a sketch file. Like people, people try to understand the success of Figma, but Figma was really successful, not because it allowed two designers to move blocks together. It was successful because all of a sudden it exposed the value of design across the organization. All of a sudden you had a design file where the CEO, the product marketing revenue generating function were in the file. And I think that's what we also need to achieve as tools. And that's why we're having all of this conversation right now as a practice about democratization and what it means. And a lot of people focus on the first part, which is, everyone can do the research, which is not the interesting part. What's interesting about democratization is the exposure of value across the arc, right? All of, the, all of what's happening right now is a failure for us as a practice to expose this value everywhere. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Just on the democratization uh, angle, um, do we want to continue talking about that for a little bit? Uh, Benjamin, you were about to make a comment. Yeah, I was just, I mean, I also come from a design background and I, I, I remember, you know, well before Figma and, and Sketch, even just Photoshop, you know, um, when I was working at Atlassian, uh, had a lot of founder involvement in my Photoshop files, uh, um, with Mike and Scott kind of in there, you know, um, questioning the position of buttons and the labels and the copy and stuff. And I think it goes back to it being visual, but I also think it's just playing into the curiosity. Like, I think if you're a designer, like a lot of people saw it as a bad thing. They're like, Oh, get out of my work, you know, get out of my, get out of my, um, discipline. Like I'm the expert here. You're not the expert, like bugger off. Whereas I actually think that designers who lent into having executives and leaders and stuff sort of collaborate and be curious and kind of supported that we're more successful. I think with research, like 
the most impactful, I think, companies that, that or customers of ours that I've seen that deploy uh, Dovetail are the ones that have, are making like in, like storytelling through video and through actually showing, you know, our stakeholders, customers, and and not necessarily abstracting it into like a long form research report, but actually actually enabling the curiosity uh, with the executives. Yeah. And then that I think, um, you know, you kind of lean into it rather than try to say like, oh, actually get out of my craft. I'm a purist. You can't do it. I can do it. I'm, I'm an expert. You're not, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, Joe, um, yeah. And I think the, the oh, my right, thoughts on this. Uh, <laughs> I think, I think um, the, I fully agree with your point. And I think the way that I like to think about democratization and the way we even expose it to uh, some of our customers is very similar to what happened 10 years ago with, with BI, right? Because I, I like the parallel because it's supporting function that work with insights, right? And when you look at the state of BI, you had a very similar profile, a, a small subset of the organization that was responsible for driving a lot of the decision, but ultimately mm. was somewhat of a black box within the org. And then companies had to make a choice. They could infinitely scale the size of the BI team to make more decisions, or they could help people within the organization make those decisions themselves. And tools like Amplitude and Mixpanel uh, created this future and ultimately created the data-driven organization, right? All of a sudden, data was central to the organization because data was accessible to everyone. And I think when I think about the democratization of research, it's, it's very similar. And when you look at the state of research, it's very similar, right? You have a ratio of one to 100 between research team and the rest of the product the department. So what it means is that companies have 100 times the means to build as they have the means to learn. And so how do we, as a practice, put the means of learning in the hands of the people that are building to unlock their decision making at scale? Because we can't, just like BI teams, infinitely scale our research department. Yeah. And that's that, that's what is democratization. Totally. It's, I think there's like a lot of a lot of stuff gets hung up on sort of democratization of the actual craft itself. But I think what we're talking about is the access to the insights and the lessons exactly. and how that needs to be. I think the BI analogy is really good, um, Jonathan. I haven't actually made that connection before, but, you know, enabling anybody in the organization to go and create their own dashboards and look at the data in certain ways and and kind of like, you know, use dashboards and, and quantitative data. Uh, we use Metabase internally at Dovetail and it's sort of, you know, self-service. Somebody can go on there. You don't necessarily have to know how to write SQL, right? You don't have to be a data scientist, yep. but you have to be able to access the data. And, and, and I think it's about tickling that curiosity uh, and actually supporting it and embracing it. Um, and I don't think you're asking people to be researchers necessarily as, as you are as saying like, hey, the research team should invest a lot in trying to get the company engaging in the insights, right? And supporting the curiosity. And that's democratization. Exactly. It's democratization of insights. Exactly. The, the people that are creating dashboard on Metabase are not BI people, right? But ultimately, right. they are the one that uh, both get the value. And because they get the value, ultimately, it makes also the role more resilient to the macro environment, for example, right? Because ultimately, yeah. people exposed to the value understand the value of this thing, so they don't want to cut it. So, um, yeah. well, I think there's been a lot of conversation about companies seeing democratization as kind of... Uh, a leverage to let go of research team. I think companies that properly set up democratization actually have a deeper sense of what research is about and a deeper sense of why they need research. Yeah, um, we're just coming up to half past. So I might uh, open up to the audience for some questions if they, so uh, folks, wherever you may be in the world, uh, just throw your questions in the chat and I'll do my best to, uh, to field them and to send them to both Jonathan and Benjamin here. Um, I do have one off the bat here from Blake Weber. Um, Benjamin, when you mentioned uh, the sort of empathy driving aspect of sharing video clips or the sort of power that uh, video or multimedia has over, say, a PDF research report, um, Blake Weber asks, how do you balance showing video clips across the org with PII concerns? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is a great question um, and something that we get asked a lot. Uh, I think it's a very organizational independent. Some of our customers, I'll just talk on behalf of Dovetail here. Some of our customers, you know, are very open internally and, and don't have a massive issue with um, uh, participant, you know, information being shared internally. Obviously, it's problematic externally. Um, however, a lot of our customers uh, want to try to uh, sort of, you know, balance both, I would say, and, and basically have like a a video recording that they can share with where, where the person is anonymized or their face is blurred. And the funny thing is we're actually working on that exact feature right now. So, you know, um, 
shortly in dovetail like in the next few months you'll be able to share a video clip and then we'll um anonymize somebody's face or or uh or uh you know modulate the voice or what have you and then when you share that clip you can hopefully the stakeholder can build the empathy while also not you know not being able to um, identify the person so <laughs> um it's about i think that's a good example actually like that's technically ai which is kind of funny so like you know we're using facial recognition um to identify people's faces because you may not want to blur like in a usability test for example you don't want to blur this the screen recording so you can't just put it over the whole video so we need to actually know like if there's a face there and if there's multiple faces and stuff so that's like ai but it's it's kind of like you wouldn't associate that with like the generative ai stuff these days so actually that i find the term ai difficult yeah. because it's it's a it's a, such a catch-all um so anyway there's a little sidebar there <laughs> um there was a question earlier about uh when we were talking about uh macro level research um and greg braun uh mentions that the medium posts and some degree this conversation uh ignores the fact that the best market research teams in client organization have been providing a macro level strategic research for years um and that like mid and low level research were required uh but market research has been doing this for years what is your thought on the sort of confluence or maybe perhaps as we do talk the future states um of like user research or ux research product research like when how might this like, how do we sort of reckon with the the, the already pre-existing market research craft and the and the pre-existing UX research craft and the sort of yeah what, what what to make of all this? And I think perhaps like a little addendum to this question is um, how do you think uh, research teams in general will be structured moving forward? Because we've seen them kind of centralized uh, in UX teams, we've seen them uh, put into product teams. So um, how do we imagine um, you know we can what can we do with all our research resources, basically, structurally speaking? Uh, Jonathan? Yeah. <clears throat> so I don't think there will be a silver, a silver bullet. I think it's it's still going to remain very organization dependent. At the end of the day, again, to, to, to get back to the BI example, I, I think that what we're seeing right now in the market with the more mature organization having chief insights officer with this ownership of, basically, at the end of the day, you want to make decisions, right? So being able to own all the decision-making functions with data and analytics and research allow you to have a more holistic view of the overall data that you have on your customers from a behavioral perspective, from a research perspective, and use all of that to create a picture that's allow you to, to move in the right direction. And so I think that's the ideal, right? Like the ideal state of thing is, is this, where it's globally reported, but locally placed within the organization, where you have one brain that can process all of this data, but then ultimately the people that are collecting the data live uh, in the different places where they need to collect the data. So in product and in uh, BI and in all of these functions. That, that I think is uh, probably what the future looks like. Yeah, I think I think Greg's point about market research is, is really valid. And I actually think market research gets overlooked a lot. It's a, it's a much more mature and, and um, sort of, you know, older discipline that I think product research, user research can probably learn some things from. Um, especially when it comes to reporting findings and insights and stuff, even like going back to consulting kind of approach. Uh, I think that I think the issue with user research is a lot of folks come from academia where that 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 time like that time accuracy equation isn't quite you know the same as in commercial world. Um, but in terms of organizational structure, I think you want you know for for the micro research if you use that sort of tiered analogy, uh, definitely embedded researchers is the way to go and then supporting the product team to improve the product being very scrappy uh you know operating in sprints uh doing a lot of usability testing blitzing kind of being the voice of the customer embedded in the product team i think that works really well and then for larger organizations if there's strategic work happening i think you just need to kind of have a sort of small centralized team that can support the leadership or executive team with um, some combination of market research competitor analysis uh concept testing etc assumption validation and I think getting away a little bit from the purity of like the specific methods and the specific definitions and the jargon and, and, you know, terms like taxonomy and stuff, I think like we have to, as a discipline, maybe get, a, get away from that a bit and just become a bit more kind of like real and speak a little bit more of a language that like product teams and designers, and engineers talk about, like, and I think that will help, you know, instead of this kind of holdover from academia, that, that's my personal opinion. I think, um, 
you know, certainly at Dovetail, we do a, we do a lot of talking to customers. I wouldn't describe it as, you know, necessarily always high quality research, but it's certainly very helpful for us as a company to learn where to go and to build empathy with customers. And, and exactly. And I think there's a tension, right, between the academia and the way that business operates in general, right? Like there's a, an understanding that business operates with trend line in general and that the reality of, of working for a company means that um, you need to be comfortable also providing this trend line. And so when you come from all of these academic background and, and we all know the, the it depends uh, of the research, right? Like the reality is that uh, you need to be able to provide something that's both assertive, uh, actionable and something that ultimately uh, the organization can use, even if it's a trend line over something that's very specific. Yeah, yeah, super flexible, I think, not rigid. Yeah. You don't want to be a purist. I think yeah, that's exactly. the issue. Yes, yeah, so I think this, this uh, Greg Braun, um, the asker of the question, mirrors that opinion that we should be bringing, bringing the disciplines together and sort of thinking about um, what the real goal here is anyway, to, to understand the customer. How can we, right. yeah. And, well, what what's crazy too is like um, this like the fragmentation across like voice of customer and CX and market research and then user research. I think that's another thing we'll probably see going forward, like over the next decade, is the consolidation of of all of these different teams and all these different data sources into one sort of centralized database. Uh, I know like some of our customers are trying to set up you know Snowflake or something like uh, build their own data warehouses internally, and and there's a lot more interest in like voice of customer and actually handling all this um, existing content that is coming in, which obviously doesn't help you so much for doing like long, long term generative, like exploratory stuff, but certainly in terms of like giving the product teams a bit more objectivity about what to prioritize. It's, it's quite useful if you could somehow process all of the tens of thousands of support tickets, for example. So I think we might see like currently CX, VOC, market research, user research, BI, you know, data and insights, analytics, all these teams currently report into like totally different uh, leaders. And I wouldn't be surprised if there's a somewhat of a consolidation as, as the tooling and infrastructure matures. I've got this really interesting question here from Nicholas Janty. Sorry, just to cut in. Um, we've got, uh, uh, Nicholas said, asked this earlier with tools like Dovetail, um, has the study output itself become antiquated in the world of continuous discovery? Uh, meaning, uh, is the idea of a study a legacy concept from academia and should we be thinking of uh like and should we be thinking of uh work product when the and when the study may be dead uh thoughts on the study is dead uh joe uh, i know that may is very <laughs> heavily invested in the idea of like continuous discovery and getting insights quickly um so what, what do you think about nicholas's comment there yeah, I think I, yeah, I think it's a great point. Um, I think for the longest time, so many companies have tried, and and Dovetail is doing a lot of this as well, like the the system of record for all of this insight. And the question then becomes how how valid are those insights after uh, some time, and how how much are we going to consume them? And the reality is, what we've seen at, at Maze, for example, is that studies and research are really consumables at this point. But it's the same way across the industry. When you look at design, a design file is a consumable. It's not something that's meant to be forever because a product at this point is a living, breathing thing, right? Like uh, we've all read uh, Yuki Yamamoto, uh, the, the, the work in progress and how they're thinking, how Figma is thinking about building product. And I think that if we, if we assume as an hypothesis that a product is a living, breathing thing that will always evolve, then the study that we do as well have to become consumables because all of those insights become things that uh, don't hold the value of time because our product is going to change dramatically as well and our audience as well. So I, I fully agree with your point. And that's the way that we we think about studies at Mace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that trying to sort of like archive and refer back to like usability testing studies, for example, is somewhat pointless in my opinion, because hopefully you've gone and fixed all the issues that came up and then the insights are no longer relevant. <laughs> I do think there's, um, there's, there's value in storing insights that are more, even, you know, more, uh, maybe long-term thinking, more strategic and being able to, uh, pull these up, you know, in ideation sessions, for example, like, again, this is something we do internally when we, when we kick off a new uh, piece of work, like actually the data, I'll, I'll do another callback. The data redaction feature that we're working on right now is actually a great one because what we've done is we have kicked off that work. Our designers and engineers have done like an ideation session and they've pulled up Dovetail and they've, and they've, and they've trawled through Dovetail and all the sales calls, customer success calls, all of the user interviews that we've done over the last few years. Anytime someone's mentioned, you know, PII redaction and like anonymization of um, interviews and things, 
they've created like highlight reels and insights and clips and stuff that they can then use to inform the ideation session. And then that gives the designers ideas and stuff to be able to like come up with concepts and everything. So like, because the, the problem of like, I need to anonymize my data is not going away and it's still relevant five years ago as it is now. And so you can feed that kind of stuff into like a session and that's actually really valuable. But if it's a very tactical, like usability testing insight, that's not going to be uh, as valuable, you know, oh, this, this button should have had an icon on it or this label's confusing. Hopefully you've fixed it and moved on. So what's the point in keeping that data around, you know? Okay, uh, we've got a question here from uh, Ali Salem. Uh, the question is, uh, pardon me, I'm green to both Dovetail and Maze, but are either supporting the collection of proactive feedback like other dashboards, i.e. Heartbeat? Um, Benjamin? Um, yeah, I mean, Dovetail doesn't um, necessarily do the collection of the data. We kind of, you know, help teams analyze and synthesize it once it's once it's been collected. But Jonathan's probably more in the uh, realm of of uh, collection tools. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, we, we do the data collection and you can collect. Um, so you can do active collection of insights through studies that you can create on the platform and then share them with your user base. And then you can do more passive collection of insights with prompts and things that live within your product. It's the same studies that live within both these things. It's just a, a distribution channel. Uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah, that, that's the way that we think about it. Yeah, on, on the study point, um, I, I find like the most successful researchers, at least that I've observed at Atlassian and at Dovetail and then also with our customers, it, are the ones that really have this open kind of collaborative process throughout and, and that the product team that they're working with or the leadership team or the strategy team or whatever it is that the researchers are supporting feel really bought into the whole process, you know, from, from defining goals and assumptions and hypotheses right through to actually consuming stuff after almost every interview. So you don't wait until you've finished this like multi-month long study to then present your findings with this like big kind of like, you know, bow wrapped around them. And so I think in that sense, the study kind of is dead and it's more about bringing the teams in. And that, that's just like a collaboration thing. That's just like a, and Figma's kind of done the same thing, right? Like the designer doesn't go away into Photoshop for like two weeks and then presents a high fidelity mock-up. They try to like do a continuous sharing, you know, uh, inviting people into the, into the file to add comments and stuff when it's at wireframe stage. And I think that, that, that kind of like open way of working might feel a bit awkward for researchers because they don't want people to draw conclusions too early. But I think that that's actually what's holding the discipline back in terms of like showing value and being a lot more visible inside organizations. So, so is it like <clears throat> minimal valuable insights at the end of the day that, that yeah. you've seen? Actually yeah, kind work? of. And I, it's fine. Interesting. And I think, I think that like, yeah, maybe this is again, like, you know, I'm kind of ragging on academia here a bit, but I think like, you know, at least, at least I'm a business owner, you know, I've got a product a company with hundred people. And I think like generally the directional insights that can come as quickly as possible are usually good to inform yeah. a decision. Yeah, it doesn't have to be a, you know, N, N to 95 percentile, you know, um, kind of conclusion to be able to actually have a lot of impact on the business. And I think that accuracy and speed trade-off just needs to be reassessed. And I think if that, if that happens inside a commercial, setting then um you can be a lot more impactful yeah. and and drive a lot more business outcomes yeah. um we've got another question here I'll, I'll i'll ask a question is actually about the uh the latest state of user research report have you both uh, had a chance to read it from user interviews i'm sure many folks at, uh, in the audience have also read it um there seems to be still to this day like a lot of generalized tools used by uh, researchers and designers such as like microsoft office and um, uh, uh, google workspaces and stuff like that um what do you think like what do you think it will take to sort of change this uh benjamin i think this is a good for you <laughs> uh yeah it's, it's super tricky i think in the report where we're like the the top specific tool after like sheets and google docs and miro and stuff and i think um look research is really difficult because it's so uh it's so diverse in terms of the, the 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 data that you deal with and the different data formats and the and the shape of those that data but all the different methods and the specificity you need like card sorting kind of tool you need like a video recording tool you need usability testing software you need surveying software 
And so I think that's why horizontal like flexible tools have succeeded because they're the only products that can really support the diverse nature of, of research. Um, you know, obviously I think over time, similar to design as well, like we were just using Photoshop for, for a long time. Right. And Photoshop was like a bitmap photo, photo editing tool. And then eventually we had Envision and then Sketch and then finally Figma kind of evolve and, and cater to that specific sort of niche of like uh, vector based user interface design. And so I think we'll start to see that as well in, um, in research as tools like, you know, Dovetail and Maze um, start to become more and more feature rich and more, more uh, you know, comprehensive to support all these different methods. Uh, you'll start to see that, that shift over time. Excellent. And, and, and I think we need to celebrate that. J just to jump on, on what you said, I think we need to still celebrate today the fact that this still happens within the notion of Google Sheet or, or wherever, because at the end of the day, it's still exposing the value of, of research to the rest of the org. Like companies that are actually doing that are the ones that are actually trying to expose as much as possible. So while it's not the ideal tool, and while we'll need to get more sophisticated with the tooling that we provide, the reality is it's still something to be celebrated because it's it's a pass in the it's a step in the right direction basically awesome um i'm just aware of the time we've hit uh 45 minutes so i'm sure um everybody has um things to do with the rest of their day um thank you for everybody who joined us from wherever you are in the world um and a special thanks obviously to both uh, benjamin from dovetail and jonathan from mays um Excellent, excellent conversation. I hope that everybody at home got a lot of value out of that. I'm just going to drop some links. We're going to be having more events coming up really, really soon. Uh, so if you want to stay in the loop, just subscribe to Dovetail's Outlier newsletter. I'll be dropping the link in now. Um, and if you want, also to continue the conversation and you're not already a member of our Slack user group, it is a fantastic place for researchers, designers, product managers, and anyone in between to come discuss all things research and customer insights. I'll, be just, I'll just chuck the uh, link you just sign up via our, uh, there's like a little sign up field you can do on our website. That's there. Um, yeah. Um, thank you to everybody. Have, have a great day, evening, afternoon, morning, wherever you are in the world.